Uh, good morning. So time has come for me to talk about worldviews and worldview theory. And why would worldview theory practice in analysis and solutions become so important? Well, it has been important for a long time that the West, the dominant Western worldview that many people have analyzed and talked about and offered solutions to, is a worldview that is no longer guiding us very well. So that's the simple point of why do worldview analysis, and worldview being even below notions of religion, notions of value systems, although those are all related to what a worldview is, how do we come to understand ourselves and our way of being, our future and purpose and mission, not only individually, but collectively, that could be as a nation, it could be as a, just a group, it could be as a species. And that's what makes us such a self-reflective species, unlike any other species that would do a video and create a reflection on how our worldview actually is determining how we are being in the world and what kind of world we're creating and how we're impacting not only the Earth solar system, but in some sense even beyond and are being impacted by those cosmic forces at the same time in a co-evolutionary, imaginative, and amazingly creative way that our species is able to do. Seriously, folks, you can see, um, we are a very unique species, and all the kudos to post-humanism, transhumanism, philosophies, ideologies that are being perpetuated today uh, I'm going to come back to here in this talk, accepting those as possible good theoretical philosophical ways to go in analysis of our future. But I am very concerned about the future, have been since I was at least 14, 15 years old, consciously aware that the way we're doing things doesn't work. We are the only species spoiling its own nest. I was aware of that before I finished high school. Something was deeply, deeply wrong, and I was deeply troubled and still am to this day at the age of 72 and a half, so on, that this is not over. And I'm giving this video at a time of a very distressing war, World War III, tipping at the edges, certainly in the Middle East, but there are other wars of horrible, horrific yet not so publicized as the Middle East-Gaza-Israeli war. So all that in context, a world that seems unsustainable with a future. If I was a child today at 10, I would say, what is my future? That's a very simple, simple notion. That is a very commonsensical question. Now, whether we allow we, the adults, encourage and culturally encourage youth to actually contemplate their future. That's another story. That's another video. That's a critique I have massively of the kind of dominant worldview that is still perpetuating a kind of denial of the realities of the mess we're in. We're not managing things well. We got, okay, we managed some things well, maybe. It's not all bad, but it's not good. And the worldview itself has come into question. So let me explain a little more about worldview. And I'm, the focus of the video is to give a comparison. And I'm going to emphasize the, my view, an integralist view of the better way to do a worldview analysis and critique and thus come up with better solutions for i.e. from policy to environmental design to an entire new kind of way of doing culture. And I know that sounds horrible and universal and meta-narrative and not very postmodern, etc. Well, I'm not going to be able to address all the complexities of what the modernists, the pre-modernists, and the postmodernists have as their conflict about what worldviews are better and 
how to even think. Like I say, to, for me to even suggest there are some kind of universals right now available to us, amazingly, from some very good researchers and thinkers that are good guideposts. That's what this is today. You can pick and choose what you think might be worthwhile or what perspective to take, but I'm going to have to, you know, edit this video down to my own thinking to try to make it um, palatable of what I'm trying to do in worldview analysis. So I am critical of other worldviews analysis. There's no worldview analysis I've seen that I completely like. And mine is a bit of a synthesis of a couple different approaches to worldviews analysis. Get to that in a moment. But the issue of a worldview, as I said, I'm not going to go into all the defining of it. You'll hear quite a bit about it in the way I speak, because I'm going to use particularly this person's work. Charles Johnson, there's a picture of him, um, recently passed away in late 2023, uh, cultural psychiatrist, as I've called him in other videos, and as he calls and addressed himself, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, cultural psychiatrist. But he's a futurist. He is a great thinker and a very creative artist as well. Not that I know a lot about him, but I have followed him for over 40 years, off and on. Recently, I've gotten this book that I just showed you, Insight, as a good summary of his work. And I'm going to actually read through the last couple of pages of his afterword because it so lays out that worldview he's suggesting. So before we get to his, worldview. Let me go back to a couple of colleagues, Darshan Narvez, Four Arrows, Wahunka Tropa is his other name in uh, Igalala Sioux, that he has been given for Four Arrows leading with Darshan Narvez, a book called The Kinship Worldview, basically, or what Four Arrows has called for a long time an indigenous worldview, a pan-indigenous worldview. And so he's quite universalist in his thinking and means including the best knowledge we have that seems scholarly and solid in terms of indigenous perspective, knowing there are many indigenous perspectives. So he is not saying one or the other, but both and there's the unique, the specific, the particular indigenous perspectives and worldviews, if you wish. But there is also a pan-indigenous worldview, which is a synthesis of all of those and what are the common grounds, right? The unique, but also the common grounds. That's what the focus is here today. I am much more a common ground or universal integralist thinker, or what's called a meta perspective, which we're going to get to Charles Johnson's idea of an integrative meta perspective for the future. His model, his approach, his theory, creative systems theory. Okay, backing up again, just as we wind to build up what I'm after. So Darshu and Four Arrows, and I will put links to their work below. They are some of the, I think, you know, most progressive in the indigenous worldview thinking and indigenous informed thinking, in my perspective. I think they are one of the most progressive, very interesting combinations they brought together. Won't go into their bios, they're huge and long, but they're both scholars and they're also both activists and powerful educators in their own way of human development. How to build a healthy, sane, sustainable future on real issues of decolonization, pre-colonization. As far as I always likes to talk, we can't just do decolonization. Again, that's more complex, interesting topics we could discuss. If you challenge me, I will definitely address those and put those in the comments. So feel free to engage in this conversation and ask questions. And 
put in your knowledge, your information, your theories, what you think is important to the future, knowing we are in a very dangerous time and trajectory. So without further ado, Four Arrows and Darsha Narvey's view is where they tend to build a world view analysis, as they say on this generic multi-perspectival synthesis that they bring. But they aren't as multi-perspectival as I would like. I have a much more, I would argue, a much more multi-perspectival approach to integral and to holistic and to worldview theorizing in philosophy than they do. They tend to come with you know, a list in their book, all the indigenous precepts, dominant worldview precepts, compare them in a chart, you know, 41 of them I think they have, and all very interesting and cover a lot of territory of reality and how humans operate and think and act and feel. And the valuing of those, obviously more valued if you're in the indigenous perspective or what they call kinship worldview, the dominant perspective, which they kind of call the whole Western modern industrial complex of a worldview. That's what we sort of know, what we call the Western dominant scientific, etc. They compare those and build their worldview theory, two framed theory, on what I would call a foundation of, which they don't acknowledge in their work that I know of. And I know their work fairly well. I'm not an expert on their work. But I am, especially with Four Arrows' work who is one of the leaders of this way of building this worldview analysis of two theories, they tend to build their analysis in that book that I'm referring to on the kinship worldview in terms of, uh, how will I say it, virtues. So it has a virtues frame, meta frame that holds it all together, which is comparing the virtue of this, the virtue of that, or the virtue of this and the vice of that, right? The opposite in a way, even though they argue and Four Arrows particularly argues vociferously, um, it is not a total binary they are working with, but yes, it is binaric. It has the qualities of polarizing world view analysis and comparison and basically, they're saying we should be more on the indigenous worldview in terms of values, which are virtues. I mean, most of those you can read, they more or less come out to a virtues. So it's like good and bad, more or less, moral, less moral, immoral. Um, but they're not totally idealistic. We can just move to one from the other, which we're in right now, right? Which is dominating the dominant Western worldview. And it's killing us. That's basically their argument and many other many, many others have argued that and I have too. So I do not use that kind of virtues framework in building a worldview theory. Well, that's really the first key point of this video, my first talk on this and I'm still developing this. I haven't written this out really well and carefully, comparing the four arrows narves in this kind of more Fisherian approach, which is really Fisherian and Johnson that I'm pur purveying here. But also there's integralist thinkers like a Charles Johnson, like a myself, who are beyond that I'm not gonna be naming in this video if you want to inquire, I rely on several different streams of integral thought, philosophy, theorizing, and ultimately an integral world meta perspective or worldview. And critical, just to make sure both Four Arrows and Darcy Narvaez are criticalists, 
I am a criticalist. Charles Johnson is a criticalist, although he is a lot lighter than I am. I'm much more a deeper conflict theory, critical theory um, thinker than they, he is as well. But what I'm bringing together as I start to read now, and I'm picking the book up very quickly, I realize that's a long intro, sorry about that, but I feel I just have to build this framework a bit so that when I read Charles Johnson, you're going to get a better feel for the comparison of why I'm reading. The comparison with this more virtues-based model of worldview analysis. I came up this morning when I was reading Charles Johnson's summary uh, in his afterword, he calls it stumbling awkwardly toward the possible future for our species and this planetary ecosystem. Stumbling awkwardly is, is a good phrase because he often says, which I really appreciate, if this theory Creative systems theory, CST, that's his thing. That's his dedicated life. 50 plus years, I believe, he's been working on that, has written near 20 books, published, runs the creative, as founder of the Creative Human Institute. I just get the name right here, <clears throat> front of the book. Eventually, at some point, the, uh, the Institute for Creative Development out of Seattle, Washington. So he's an American, he's a white guy and all those problems, just like I'm, uh, you know, Eurocentric history roots, white guy um, in Canada. So I've been kind of watching for Arrow's work and his development. Then he joined with Darthur Narvaez. I've been watching Charles Johnson and some other integrals like Ken Wilber, for example, really important in my work and life trajectory for the last 40 plus years and I've been building slowly and watching this trajectory kind of triangulating there's different views of a worldview analysis and as an integralist that's what I'm interested in always finding you know those many differences how to pull them together pull the best from all of them and build a synthesis which I would like to have and think that is better than the others not because I'm superior to the others, but because I'm a creative person. I always want to create better combinations and solutions. That makes me an innovator. Every innovator who builds Mousetrap wants to build one better than the ones that are already out there. Otherwise, why would you build one? It's the better and how we define better that is much more complex and a moral issue and an ethical issue, which I take very seriously. So let's get beyond better, but let's get to which is more complete is another way that integrals like to talk more complete, more multi-perspectival. And that's what my critique is again of Four Arrows in the Darshan Narvaez direction, their sort of trajectory of this virtues-based worldview analysis. Okay, so we want to integrate the best of that. We want to add it to something else. And when I say add, I don't just mean X plus Y. I'm talking about a real synergy, right? Where X plus Y is more than X plus Y. It's a Z. It's of a new dimension that you move into. It's like a quantum leap of bringing together. And that's what I would like to bring to the planet in my legacy. And I still have probably maybe a decade or two to live here to pull off that synthesis and certainly welcome others to do that with me. Poirot's bringing that particular perspective, I call the indigenous perspective overall toward worldview analysis. Charles Johnson, in my view, brings what I would call a creative perspective to worldview analysis. Again, put them both together and let's Utilize those to a new futures planning, design, and operations, how we think, fat, eat, you know, drink, uh, build things, act, feel, treat each other. And hopefully, I say that lightly, hopefully, I mean, 
optimistically but pessimistically, we can do much better and build a much better world. Okay. Let's get into the actual options that uh, we are going to get going to get from Charles Johnson as a really good summary. So I think I'll just read through it in a couple of pages and I'll comment on and tell you how I interpret some of Charles Johnson's work. Just before I do that, I am just lucky enough to have received, you know, about 14 different volumes of his works. Now that he has passed away, I had made a good connection with someone at the Institute that he began and I got a copy of each of those books and including some posthumously published ones just in the last 2024 here. So I feel very fortunate to have that body of work and his work is not that well known. So that's my first estimate of it does didn't get a large following. It got a significant following, his creative systems theory, but it didn't get a large distribution. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, I think there's a lot of resistance to it because it is so potently asking us to change our dominant worldview. I think it also, just because of the structure who he probably was as a personality, as a character, all of these things I'm still inquiring into um, posthumously. I, I wish we could have conversation person to person with him, but for various reasons, we didn't carry that on. We had a few interactions on once on the phone in the nineties and once or twice or so in emails over the years. But I always wanted to get connected with his work. Um, it just didn't come back that he would, you know, instigate that with me. So it never happened. But his creative systems theory has a set of concepts and insights. And this is why I thought 10 of them here, just to start, and there's more, I'll see how far we get before I want to cut this video off, maybe do another second version uh, in, in a series here on Charles Johnson, Charles M. Johnston, MD. Great thinker for our time. So we can be more specific, he says, about what is new by summarizing the major concepts of this creative systems theory, right? This creativity. Remember, I mean, we're, we're talking now the artistic side. Creativity, main focus for Charles Johnson, as it is often for me. And I don't, you know, buy everything Charles Johnson says, but let's let's go into it. It's it's really interesting way to do worldview analysis, and he calls it a worldview. He is offering. So number one, what is included in this book, Insight, that I just showed you the cover of earlier, the concept of cultural maturity, capital C, capital M. This. Over and over, he's got a whole huge thick book on cultural maturity. I haven't dove into it totally. I just scanned it bits and he'll tell you everything he thinks about and his rationale. He's a very systematic cognitive thinker about what cultural maturity would be. And you can see capital C, capital M means it's universal. He isn't saying that you can apply it exactly everywhere and in every context and situation and get a good result. He's not saying that, he's not there. He's often saying, if this theory is correct, X, Y, Z, there will be good consequences. If it's not correct, and he often says that, if this isn't correct. So you're reading in his writing, he's very humble that way about it being a good theorist, a good philosopher, if this is correct. But there's a lot of good evidence it probably is. Well, that's what a good theory is. It's just supposing based on good premises, good thought. And that is something I do not see when I look at the four arrows, Darshan Narve's approach, and there's others, to this indigenous worldview contrast with the dominant worldview. It, because it's so virtues-based, you just do not get that feeling of reading those people's works where they'll say, if this is correct, if it's not correct, 
dot, 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 consequences. No, they don't do that. It, and that's typical of virtues theory because virtues theory and the meta framing of a virtues framework, philosophically, ideologically, and otherwise, tends to always set up the good and the bad. So, so they don't even go to, if this is true, they always go, no, that's true. And that's not, right? What What isn't the virtue is the vice. So that's why I've never liked that kind of thinking. I find it all too in, indoctrinated within a kind of moralism that I just don't find appealing fully. And I think it's still quite incomplete from an integralist perspective, a, a true holistic plus to integralist perspective, which Charles Johnson actually is calling as I said, an integrative meta perspective he was using. So the concept of cultural maturity as understood in relationship to integrative meta perspectives, cognitive reorder. So that's one of his concepts and insights in this theory, in this book he presents, this worldview. Cognitive reordering. And meta perspective is a perspective of all perspectives. That's the idea of it. Charles Johnson's not the only one to use that notion of meta perspective. And Wilbur does, and many others. I do too. But cognitive reority tells me something where I'm a little less attractive to Charles Johnson's theory because of his overly ambitious, if not overly obsessed, focus at times on what seems to be the cognitive and the metacognitive thinking. Now, Four Arrows is interested in metacognitive thinking too, as with Darcy Narvaez, but um, not quite in the same way and not as huge of perspective as a Charles Johnson or an integral Ken Wilber uh, takes on meta perspective or myself. So cognitive reordering basically is we have a thinking problem, right? The cognitive, it's about our thinking. So he's very big on thinking one would think maybe is he just another rationalist coming out of the Western modern enlightenment worldview and that building of a dominant worldview from that enlightenment period of the last you know 400 years, European history. He's not totally of that camp and you will have to discover that by reading and looking. He actually challenges um, the whole notion of the rational as being the be all end all. But he still says, no matter what, if you're writing a book and if you're teaching, you're very cognitivist. That is a very cognitivist process as it is for the indigenous worldview people who are like Four Arrows or Darsha, marking out and theorizing and philosophizing and writing books and teaching cognitively as a front end. It is um, not that there isn't emotional, affective or moral aspects, but it is cognitive, cognitive, cognitive. And that's because we're all scholars of some some kind. You can't get away from that. So let's move on. The dilemma of differentiation. This is number two, the dilemma of differentiation. I love that. It's a very big part of my theory. I do not see it in the four arrows, Darcy and Arve kind of virtues framework of worldview analysis. So uh, here I align much more with the Johnson approach here differentiate meaning that in evolutionary developmental stages and development that there are the problems of how do you go from one condition of a unity condition like an egg to two right? so you start with a single egg fertilize goes to the two condition after that so it's from that one condition, the universal, the oneness, to the two-ness. Um, this is a process of differentiation. Some people call it distinction. Now we can see more. And evolution, the theory behind it, is everything tends to move in differentiations. That's what growth is when it's based on that. Now, a cancer growth pattern and a pathological pattern that we could hook to a name that cancer growth is less differentiation. It's actually producing more sameness and not so much difference, okay? Enough on that differentiation, but 
that's a very complex concept that moves into we have to understand dissociation from distinct from differentiation and the problems of that. So let me just read number two, it's more, and finish it. Charles Johnson, the dilemma of differentiation and its relationship to the challenge of thinking in ways that reflect that we are living human beings. So he really, he really wants this new creative systems theory, this creative frame he uses to keep remembering we are living human beings. So he tends to be probably definitely more humanistic in orientation. He's not coming in with the big decolonizing lens of a four arrows or a Darshan Arve or many of those other worldviews. Um, not many, but there's others who are doing that kind of decolonizing, recolonizing work. No, Charles Johnson never got into that for various reasons. I don't know why. But he's added his. And as I said, I went both. Give me that virtue based, give me this creative base, and now I think we're gonna have a much better worldview analysis. The two combined. Third one is application of the creative frame as a solution to the problem of understanding in living systems terms and as a way to bring detail and nuance to the understanding of human systems. Number four, a creative framing, you can see that's very important for him, of polarity and its relationship to developmental processes. That's very different, similar to the number two dilemma of differentiation, the framing of polarity, because from one, no problem with polarity problems or the binary problem, but once you go to differentiation, next stage of development, then you get the possibility of opposites in the two. And he is very similar because he wants a complementarity principle driving and that's what he sees in creative systems and I agree and it would be very similar to Paul Earl's approach um, with the indigenous pan-indigenous complementarity of polar opposites is very similar so there is overlap between two and that of course we'd expect that if, if these are speaking some truths of universal great value of understanding development and growth right growth development creativity in creative systems Number five, a creative framing of intelligence as multiplicities. That's pretty much self-defining. Um, Lots of perspectives on what intelligence is. Again, that would be very welcomed in the virtues-based approach to worldviews. Number six, the myth of the individual is really under systematic critique, and we need a more systematic systems theory understanding. So he really comes strong with systems theory, now, much more than I find the virtues people to do, even though they're very aware of systems theory. He is deeply, deeply systems theory, as am I. And most integralists are all systems theorists. With the idea, so number seven, of whole person, whole system patterning, there it is. He's got capital S on system patterning. And I am underlining the word patterning um, concepts, how integrative meta perspective makes it possible to think about truth at its most basic ways. And this is formative ways um, that gets beyond ideological assumptions. And that's where I find the virtues is more ideological framework. The creative frame goes deeper into the formative, proto-formative, pre-formative. It's more aesthetic. And Charles Johnson's work is really wonderful. When I first saw it in 1991, and I saw him drawing these circles and, and, and patterns, and I went, and he's saying, this is how creative development works, you know, universally, micro, meso, macro level. And I thought, whoa, okay, this really hits the creative artist, the, the, the map maker of, of those kind of meta theoretical formative understandings, right? In the form before the content. And, and this is a really complex conversation of what is form and the philosophies of form, the feelings of form. And again, before content. And so that's why the word patterning really hits. And I'm not saying there isn't patterning analysis in the best of the worldview analysis that's virtue-based. 
Poros, etc. But the patterning emphasis, the depth of nuance, understanding patterning, and I love that. I have a lot of that in my work. Um, I don't find in the, in the virtuous people's work. And so number eight and nine um, just fall through uh, nicely from what he just called getting to the patterning of the tr thinking of the truths. Thinking is a really broad concept for him, so don't get hung up on it. It's just all about the head. That gets beyond ideological assumptions and ideological outcomes and belief systems, moral systems. He's really trying to undergo underneath that. And I think like a, a Nietzsche, you know, beyond good and evil um, kind of philosophy. Um, that would be a whole other interesting conversation to compare what Nietzsche was trying to do, you know, at the turn of the century, 19th century, the 20th century. But his eight and nine are patterning in time concepts he brings in and let us address temporal context. Patterning in space is number nine, concepts that provide a way to address here and now contextual variables. So he is a contextualist. He is a obviously a constructivist as well, that we are co-creating everything in systems is co-creating. So he utilizes constructivist theories and ideas, philosophy, he, contextualist theories and philosophies. Postmodernists would be happy about that as well. And then he adds more of this integral component. And that's Ken Wilber's basic definition when you put all those three, constructivist, contextualist, and integral aperspectivalist, which Charles Johnson does not cite Ken Wilber's integral theory, which I think is a huge error on his part not to do so, and vice versa. Wilber didn't cite Charles Johnson. And I, I was going, guys are crazy not to be talking to each other or at least citing each other's work. It's there's so much overlap. So I was the overseas seer seeing all that in the missing there. But yes, the point being that is the definition of the best of postmodernism, says Ken Wilburn. I totally agree. Those three conditions, those three types of perspectives. They're huge. They have a huge impact on knowledge and knowledge making and meaning and sense. And number 10, parts work. Uh, I to totally don't, haven't read enough of what he means by parts work as a major contribution to available approaches for inquiry and understanding. They think parts work basically means we got to give you practical too in applying creative systems theory down to the parts, but always realizing it's a part whole. And that's what Ken Wilber argues fundamentally in his early works in the 90s. This is a holonic approach. Holons, part holes slash okay and then he says there's a few more questions and he gives again some more detail and i really feel these are important to walk through slowly i know this is going to be a long bit of a long video because of it but it's just so good to hear how he tweezes apart in a way that the virtues people don't tweeze the same way um, they tend to focus more on moral teachings and this is not here, but you, there's obviously a moral base underneath all of this, and that is, is to follow the laws of creative systems, which is creation, capital C, creative systems, capital C, capital S. This is where Johnson is. He was, he was a very respectful, very sanctified uh, thinker, and he loved the embrace. So let's just read a bit more. He says, um, a handful of more specific questions help fill out where these notions take us and the consequences, both consequences that may be at first unsettling and those that we should clearly celebrate. So he talks often about how unsettling it is to challenge the way we think. He's not the only one to say that. Yeah, all worldview analysis and the self-responsibility to do a worldview analysis of my own thinking and ways of living and the society in which I belong to and its ways of thinking. The education system that supports that, the governments that support that worldview and that thinking and being, ways of being, 
we need to be able to go through the unsettling. And that's, that's a nice word for the terror of change at a deep world view level or meta a level. And he's right that this requires a whole cognitive reorienting and pre prioritizing and developmental capability, capacitance, he calls it, Charles Johnson. And I think of the developmentalists, particularly Robert Keegan out of Harvard, Educational Psychology School, and his massive amount of work and research on when we've gotten in over our head because we're not developing the cognitive structures, consciousness structures in our mind systems to handle the amount of complexity of the problems that are coming to us that we have also created because we weren't thinking in the large, large term in the meta perspective of ways of this kind of good stuff and awareness of our effect of our own worldviews and their biases. Okay, let's go on to his questions and then he's got some more real specific things that I think help give you a sense of creative systems theory and what it's bringing to the table. And then I'll wrap up the video. So he says, what do we necessarily leave behind? This feels very important in his creative systems theory. We're going to have to leave stuff behind. Why? Because stuff is, we need to change our worldview. So we're going to have to leave things that are related to how we thought, felt, operated in the old, it's called the older worldview or the less functional, the less complete, even pathological parts of that worldview as we move to new worldviews, building a new worldview. And those arguably have levels as well. You don't just go from one to the other. That's why I don't like the binary uh, imaginary of the virtues worldview peoples. I'm more interested in a developmental continuous and well-researched understanding of how that developmental works. Again, at very deep structures, universal structures, realizing all the diversity, yes, all the different ways of interpreting each of those, the horizontal, but there's also a vertical part. And that's where the integralists keep this verticality very intact. Less so do I find the case. Um, they're not as interested generally, the virtues peoples. Why do we necessarily leave behind with culturally mature understanding, which is the outcome he wants from this creative system theory? It has to lead to cultural maturity, he says, otherwise, it's ridiculous, it's wasting time, spending time on any kind of systems theory, thinking and practices. And I can tell you, there is a lot of waste of time on systems theory that is not interested in cultural maturity. And like Johnson, like myself, like Charles would say, yeah, that's gonna lead us to another dead end. We'll, we'll create more and more systems that are deadly, toxic, lead to extinction a species side. So integrative meta perspective requires that we surrender, keyword underline, much that in times past has been essential to our experience of purpose and identity. Depending on our capacitance, we may experience these losses as threats or invitations to step forward. In other words, we'll resist the change because we don't have certain capacities. So Creative systems theory, ideas of cultural maturity and theorizing of this worldview analysis has to have steps and stages to build that capacitance. There is that in the virtues worldview analysis as well. Yeah, they're basically saying practice these virtues, you will build capacitance to be able to resist that dominant worldview and its impingements trying to pull you back to that dominant. It's dominant because it's dominant. So we are creating a new, call it revolutionary, radical, whatever you want, worldview. So there's similarities and we have to build capacitance and it takes nuanced practices, educating ourselves, learning, becoming aware to do that. Okay, so let's get down. Cultural maturity's cognitive reordering takes us beyond 
But here's a critique, right? I've said this is a, they're both critical perspectives, these worldview analysis. Unlike some, some worldview analysis are more functional. It's not critical, political as much as what I'm talking about today and what I'm interested in. He says, quote, this is supposed to be left behind as we're shifting to this creative worldview that he calls it. Creative systems worldview. Ideas of, quote, chosen people, notions of national and social identity have to change and be left behind, surrendered to. That's in inadequate. And I'm saying he's talking about ego-based, social and ethnocentric-based worldview systems, ethnocentrism, nationalism, et cetera. Of course, we're going to integrate those. It's not like you just cut them out and throw those away and then we have something new to replace it. Well, no, no, it doesn't work like that. Evolution doesn't work like that. Both natural evolution and cultural evolution, as far as I know, or even spiritual evolution. Generally, it's a, it's a process of stages and steps and integrations okay, for the transformation. The chosen people, notions, and national and social identity have to be left behind, surrendered. Heroic and romantic concepts of limitless possibility have to be surrendered. This has been a deadly concept of limitless possibilities. And so all people who are pushing the possibilities framework or paradigm nowadays, right? I hear all their positivity toward, oh, possibility thinking, da, da, da. It's so great. It's so creative. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's not about limited possibilities and certainly it's not about thinking that we don't have a limited resource planet here so ecological critique has had this world view so an ecological world view orientation which comes back even further than a lot of the indigenous critique of late they're connected right the indigenous and the eco critiques in worldview change and what's required and they all say that Romantic concepts of limitless possibility and the heroic have to be challenged. The heroic and challenging that is a huge discussion. Um, don't get me started on that. Another video of what does that mean, challenging the heroic and the pathologies of the heroic that we've inherited in this dominant worldview. So next one is the idea that truths are fixed and absolute. We have to surrender. Mythologized notions of leadership, we have to surrender. Absolutist moral codes and laws, we have to surrender. The equating of rationality with intelligence, we have to surrender. There, so he's not a rationalist. He's not about promoting rationalism, per se, even though he's very cognitivist, more so than a lot of the other worldview analysis might be. The idea that one person can be the answer and completion for another, no, surrender that. A belief in identity as who we think we are and unfettered freedom, free will, as an expression of such an identity. No. So you'll see there's several identity surrenderings here. I think there's like three or four of them if we were to put them all together. Yeah, when you change your worldview, and this worldview analysis, this critical analysis, you will be involved in a critical self-reflective, changing, shifting, transforming, healing in which a new identity and identities will be formed. And he is definitely not totally in favor of alone, just a move to this kind of political identity correctness move that's going on right today. He's, it actually writes about its limitation and it tends to just form another kind of ethnocentrism um, within were there this a very specific color sexual orientation political identity formation and therefore we should have privilege and rights and all kinds of things okay maybe that's good to a point in its creative system but if that's all you have and you don't have a bigger view of the entire creative systems big picture and then check up yourself check up yourself check up your wanting to narrow down identities to such political entities and lose the relationship between the natural and the spiritual. So it's not just cultural identity. So I love Charles Johnson's model because it's such an attack on the 
mythology of culturalism, where one thinks that they can build an identity out of culture, and they iconicize and really devote themselves to culture, pop culture, and all of these worlds swirling in cultural reality, and it's only one third of an integralist frame of reality, cosmic perspective. So a cosmocentric perspective, an integralist cosmocentric perspective would include the natural, the cultural, and the spiritual realms. It doesn't put cultural as totally privileged. And that's what we've gotten into, sadly, through a lot of generations of culturalism. And then he's got the last three, I'll read, um, that we have to surrender is postmodern beliefs that make truths options endless. Again, it's kind of the problem of unfettered freedom to think whatever you want, have different identities for whatever you want, that everything is limitless. It's just imagine our imagination is the limit. That, and then, eh, that's like way too swingy, loosey, not connected to big picture worldview, critical analysis. And he's basically saying these postmodern beliefs, often called relativism, um, that makes truth options and reality options endless. Well, a lot of posthumanism, transhumanism, I find, falls into that not so good categorizing and, and rebuilding of what they think is a posthumanist or transhumanist worldview. Another topic for another time, but it, it, this is why I find this much more satisfying than those solutions offered by those kinds of thinkers and theorists. And then he says, we have to surrender parental, omniscient notions of spiritual truth. This kind of paternalizing is what he's getting to behind you know, paternalistic religions and the paternalizing of ideological, secular religions and, and views, worldviews. And this is the way. And of course, the danger he's also putting in is we have to surrender thinking that critical systems theory, the very paradigm theory worldview he's offering, Charles. Johnson, or my own, or others, we have to also get beyond our offering. And, and again, I said the virtues people I find don't have that same kind of critical analysis of their own model, of their own theory, of their own worldview, meta worldview analysis. And they they are doing a meta worldview analysis, just like Charles Johnson, Ken Wilber, myself, and others. But this idea of we have to watch that we don't become omniscient. And that's when you the danger of moralistic and virtue-centered types of approaches can tend to move that direction quite easily, uh, I find, when you're not so open-ended um, for when I may say open-ended, I don't mean just totally endless, you know, massive, endless questioning, 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 isn't that wonderful? Let's question everything. Oh, but that that gets so thin. If you don't have verticality, and that's why the creative systems theory and the integralist theory is developmental as a vertical structure so that you don't get into just the horizontal mass of whatever, whatever endlessly, the many. So it's a kind of, you know, working toward a combination of the horizontal, vertical type of singularity theories, theorizing you know, one could go into. I'm not going to go into that because I don't know enough about those theories, but I, I know they're out there and people are searching for how to integrate the two, the horizontal and the vertical. Although not many. Most are interested in the horizontal. Today. And then he says we have to surrender the mechanistic deterministic science as last word. So in that last critique, he's really critiquing kind of religious spiritual truths. Um, formations from the old dominant worldviews, and he's critiquing the scientific, mechanistic, materialistic, deterministic approaches from the science world. And obviously, he's suggesting there's a new um, way to approach cultural maturity that doesn't fall into those paternalistic, dominating narratives and, and regimes of truth. And it's real structures that oppress people and oppress other species. Beings. Okay, so I think uh, that's probably lots. Uh, there isn't a whole other section on where I kept looking. Where is he going to talk about fear and its importance, of course, because that's my specialty. And he doesn't go into it at all like I would like to. And 
that's why I do appreciate Four Arrows particularly goes into that more in his work. Um, although in his his worldview analysis per se, he, you know, it's it's not the forefront of his criteria for analyzing, you know, being in touch with reality, not being in touch with reality. I, I go into it way more in my work and I'm unique that way as a a worldview theorist, if you will. But uh, for Charles Johnson does say that we need a greater tolerance for uncertainty and complexity. Uh, as he goes on in that chapter, I again, I won't read. And how could I say that? I mean, it sounds so simple to say we need more flexibility, capacitance, more ability to handle the ambiguity, the opposites, the polar opposites. This is all good existential development, and that's a whole kind of level of human development, arguably, as many have talked about, is when you move to an existential capability or capacitance, a level of cognitive capability, um, able to work with these polarities, opposites, and, and the great uncertainty of when you start moving out of the old worldview. Because remember, worldviews are like a defense system, ultimate, and arguably, and I'm kind of Ernest Beckerian here, my cultural critical analysis of worldviews is they they are defenses, they're buffers to a fear of chaos, a fear of lack of order, a fear of losing control. And so there's always a danger of a kind of security, safety, enclosure, right? A kind of boxing in and freezing almost of truths, realities, moral goods, etc., universal principles. And so he's saying is if you're going to go through worldview analysis, be prepared. You're going to kind of fly back to the old. I want it to be the old way is more secure there, more safe, uh, more certain. Now going into this new worldview, I don't fully understand it. Well, that arguably from the developmentalist point of view, that does happen when you start shifting up levels of um, cognitive development to higher levels from you know, concrete operations to formal operations to post-formal operations to integral post post formal operations as some theorists have been arcing that we are capable of as human beings and creative beings. So um, I'll finish with creativity at the center. That's kind of the simple words, creativity at the center it is Charles Johnson. Again, one of his books that are available of his many, you may or may want, not want to read his work. Uh, he's interested in human possibility, the human potential. He's like every one of the theorists I've mentioned today, we're all interested in human potential. And we're interested in how do you actually do that in a good, integrated, integral, holistic way, but also critical, right? It, it can't just be a functionalist systems theory. Okay, that's lots for today. Um, thanks for tuning in and uh, forward to your comments.